Thank you, Ambassador Barry. I think you've started us off uh, with a wonderful comprehensive picture of the impact of criminalization in terms of public health, in terms of stigma, in terms of discrimination, and really the, the barrier that it poses to scaling up effective HIV responses and making smarter investments um, in HIV responses. I'd like to start with um, a range of community perspectives about the impact of criminalization, and not just criminalization in terms of the laws on the books, but also the enforcement law enforcement, the impact of law enforcement on human rights from the community perspective, from the most affected communities. And I see Justice Kirby sitting in the front row. Could I ask you to come up and join us, please? Thank you very much. Um, so Ruth, uh, many of our, our, our esteemed community leaders who are here were part of a process of the Global Commission on HIV and the Law. Uh, which really had the strength of the report is that it is based on evidence and evidence from the community perspective on the impact of law. Um, not just the negative impact, but also what are some of the solutions that we can undertake, the good practice that we need to scale up to do away with criminalization and to banish criminalization into the shadows. So Ruth, over to you, and then we'll just make our way down the panel. So, so I want to talk about some of the laws that are used against sex workers, which aren't the criminal laws, um, and about the lack of law enforcement, the lack of protection of law, because this month alone, in July, in Baghdad, Iraq, a brothel was raided by fundamental Islamists, and 29 sex workers and two men who were in the brothel were murdered. And on the door of the brothel was named, this is the fate of any in prostitution. Then, two days later, we had the closure of the Nagai brothel area in Bangladesh, where more than a 1,000 sex workers lost their homes and their workplaces. Um, when the local antisocial committee evicted them all from the area. Um, and for me, that was part of the municipal approach. So it was actually state that was doing this to members of the community. And this is a country in which that brothel has existed for centuries. Um, and the women have been just literally thrown out on the streets. And this is happening increasingly in countries. Um, so I really think that we need to look at where is the protection of law enforcement for my community? That's female, male, and transgender sex workers. Um, and what are we going to do when members of society take away even our right to life? Fantastic. Thank you. Nick? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. I guess, uh, <coughs> uh, I think everybody may or may not know I was uh, convicted of criminal transmission of HIV in the state of Iowa, U.S. Uh, back in 2008. Yeah. Yeah. Can't hear you. you wanna just move it up, maybe? Or, okay. Yeah, okay. maybe go up there. Yeah. It might be a bit easier. Is this better? Yes. Okay, very good. Um, I was convicted of criminal transmission of HIV in 2008 in the state of Iowa, U.S. And, uh, you know, the basics are that I wore a condom, my viral load was undetectable, there was no transmission of HIV, yet the judge sentenced me to 25 years in prison. Um, I served a little bit over a year, and thanks to community pressure from, uh, you know, various letter writing campaigns that we're not just within the borders of the U.S., um, you know, the HIV Justice Network, GMP Plus, and, you know, people from Europe and beyond were amazing in uh, assisting and getting me out of the prison setting. And so, you know, uh, getting out of prison was the first step, and I was glad to work on some advocacy in the state of Iowa, and, you know, uh, I was even at the launch of the Global Commission on HIV and the Law, and, and that was an honor. So just the Cliff's notes of uh, the trajectory of my case, uh, charged in 2008, convicted in 2009, sentence reconsidered uh, later in 2009. I now have taken my case through two appeals at the district court level, and finally uh, went to the Iowa Court of Appeals. You know, it was uh, denied, 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 and finally I made it to the highest court in the state of Iowa, the Supreme Court, in which case, uh, six to one, um, my case was overturned. So, yeah, thank you. So, uh, the battle is not over. 
Uh, unfortunately, the, even though Senator McCoy and several other advocates in the state of Iowa have worked very hard to modernize Iowa's law, to get the you know, former law repealed, a new law which is, uh, you know, much, makes much more sense uh, in place, um, which incidentally, the circumstances of, uh, that led to my conviction would not have been a crime at all under the new law in Iowa. Uh, however, the charge is grandfathered in, and I'm facing the charge all over again as though it were 2008. So the difference this time is, is now I have uh, a lot of public opinion on my side, which was greatly impacted by uh, the Des Moines Register, you know, the, the most uh, esteemed newspaper in the state of Iowa, and, you know, much better attorneys and, and you know, more information, more knowledge than when I was sentenced in, in 2009. This has taken a great toll on me and my family. Um, I was, you know, some people on the panel have been kind enough to, you know, call me a leader, I, I guess, and, you know, um, e express appreciation or, you know, admiration for the work that I've done. But I will say that behind the scenes, I'm, I'm not always as together as I appear on paper. But, um, doing the best that I can and, you know, trying to make a difference uh, with what voice I have, you know, what little instrument I play in this whole symphony that is HIV criminalization. I, you know, my financial burdens are upwards of $45,000, you know, for, uh, and, and again, I should add that the new law in Iowa um, has a retroactive clause which removed me from the sex offender registry. And that happened uh, about a week before we had a, uh, the first national conference on HIV criminalization in the state. Uh, state Senator Matt McCoy cut off my GPS ankle bracelet in a pretty exciting ceremony, along with another individual who was uh, convicted under the same charge. No more polygraph tests. I can be around my nieces and nephews without supervision. Uh, I, you know, I, I have lost jobs, great jobs, because of this conviction even though it was a consensual situation with another adult with no transmission. Um, you know, I've been consistently in the local news in the small rural state of Iowa since 2008, and that hasn't uh, you know, dissipated yet, but I'm looking forward to that. But every time I see my mugshot on TV, I just like shudder a little bit. Um, but, you know, beyond what I've suffered, my family has endured a great deal. My, it was too much for my father to bear. We have not spoken since uh, 2000 early 2009. My mother has uh, started having heart problems, and I mean, I kind of, I don't know why I chuckle when I say that, but um, anyway, there's a certain family embarrassment and uh, difficulty. Forgive me. Um, however, on the plus side, I, I would like to believe that my case, uh, not me specifically, but the case, and the extreme situation with regards to the circumstances that led to the conviction and the harsh, you know, punitive, uh, the harsh punishment imposed by the state of Iowa made my case very, uh, you know, sexy for uh, how it has been portrayed in the media. And I, th I would like to believe that it has played a certain part in helping Iowa become the first state to substantially, uh, you know, modernize its law. And so there are definite, you know, positives, you know, turning lemons into lemonade. And I've, uh, you know, gotten to, you know, do various events and put a face on it, and that is an honor to me. And it's given my life some new purpose, because unfortunately my old purpose of, uh, you know, managing hotels has kind of had to be put on hold, possibly indefinitely. So maybe this is a part of my life now, permanently, we'll see. Needless to say, um, I've always said it, it's not the army that takes you around the world, sometimes it's felonies, and I've gotten to do great travel, meet <laughs> fascinating people, and I'm very grateful to be here with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story, Nick, and I'm always struck every time that I have, I've had the privilege of hearing you speak a number of times about how so much of the law enforcement around criminalization and the application of the law is based on prejudice, fear, myth, lack of scientific understanding of the epidemic. And we heard from Michael yesterday very eloquently that good law 
must be rational, it must be based on evidence. So really in terms of um, a takeaway message from around criminalization of HIV transmission is we really have to interrogate, you know, what is the scientific basis for, for the application of these laws? Um, and the impact, as we, can, as we heard from Nick, is devastating at the individual level, at the family level, at the, uh, at the community level. I'm going to move on now to Ashok Rakhavi from India, um, who is probably the oldest MSM activist, not in age, but um, in terms of experience uh, um, in India. And I'd like you to talk to us a little bit about uh, the situation around MSM, men who have sex with men um, in India, and the 377 case. Well, a quick report. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, a quick report. It's been a roller coaster ride for us in India over the last 10 years. Uh, I mean, my organization, the Hamsafa Trust, started work in 1990, and uh, those were really critical times. In the sense, Section 377, introduced by the British for the first time, which criminalized same sex, or at least non penovaginal vaginal sex, uh, was for various other political reasons. There were other laws that complemented this law, which the Criminal Tribes and Castes Act, for example, which was removed by the Indian Parliament in 1954. With the very fact that you were born a transgendered person or you were transgendered gave the authorities the right to arrest you without warrants. Uh, these were British laws that tried to marginalize other gender identities which they did not agree with. So uh, we had Section 377 which criminalized uh, same-sex relations and um, uh, it's it very oddly drafted. Carnal uh, intercourse against the order of nature. Nobody describes mm. what nature is all about. But it's obviously that if it's not penovaginal, you're a criminal. And it led to enormous stigma and discrimination, besides the fact that it led to, of course, incredible cases of extortion, blackmail, violence in public spaces. And not only that, but the whole surrounding atmosphere and ambience around this law was, for example, if you were homosexual and you were caught in public with condoms, it was already assumed that you were ready for sex. So you could be taken in, harassed, they would remove the money or the, uh, whatever you were wearing, like your gold chain or whatever. And uh, throughout these, uh, this terrible episode, which started in 1990, but the recording of the affidavit started from 1995 onwards, and I think Mandeep was very much part of that uh, incredible campaign, which led to the decriminalization of, of uh, same-sex relations in, um, uh, on July 2nd, 2009. And uh, it led to a burst of pride and visibility of LGBT people in India. There were gay marches for the first time. And not only that, but there was an easing of this, the violence on the streets. There was definitely a feeling that one era has passed. Of course, it was rarely used. Section 377 was rarely used. There were local laws. For example, there's something called the Bombay Public Nuisance Act. And there the police can anticipate that you will cre create, uh, you'll, you'll do something wrong. So the police anticipates that you might have sex half an hour later. And they could take you in. I mean, this is the first thing of telepathy in the police forces. But the point is that these laws were used to harass us and they still use these laws because the, the situation as far as Section 377 is concerned is at the moment we are recriminalized again. It's a sort of topsy-turvy thing. The Supreme Court, uh, based on the fact that it never read the Delhi High Court judgment, assumed that we were a minuscule minority. I don't know what that means because the Constitution gives you protection even if you're all alone in the whole of India and your rights need to be protected. And yet there is a Supreme Court judge who says because you're a minuscule minority, you need not be given the rights that are given to you by the Constitution of India. And that's under this, we are going on a curative petition. But why I would like to say that it's a roller coaster ride is there is this incredible business of an upsurge in pride, the removal of stigma and discrimination around same-sex relations, uh, the feeling that transgender people are getting respected in society, the feeling that gay men could finally get together in public spaces without violence. 
uh, that has suddenly gone for a toss. We are back to square one. There's an incredible amount of despondency. And the helplines now in India really are not from the LGBT communities. They're from the siblings and parents of sexual minorities. Do you think my son could be arrested? Do you think my daughter could be arrested just because she's like that? So this is the new fear. The new wave of fear now extends into the families also. It's not only among LGBT. And that's important. And no one's going back in the closet. The war is now on many fronts. And as far as the, the LGBT NGOs and the CBOs go, the, these laws have really empowered us to fight the state, you know, for what is freedom and justice in a society where the Constitution of India is supposed to reign supreme. I'll leave it at that. Fantastic, thank you. And I think two interesting points from... from Ashok and Ruth, that it's not just a law which criminalizes per se or specifically, but there are a whole host of other laws which can be used to perpetuate human rights violations, to perpetuate violence, to make people more vulnerable, to hinder their access to services. And I know that you know, when the Supreme Court gave its decision, um, you know, uh, basically striking down the d decision of the Delhi High Court, UNAIDS did some quick research to see the impact of this decision on access to services for MSM, and it was quite significant, the drop-off in access to services. So the evidence for the role of the law and the importance of the law in protecting rights and really improving access to services for, for communities. So really, I think in one story, a roller coaster, Ashok, the positive and really the negative. Manisha, Manisha's from Nepal, um, I think a leader in, in the global community around transgender rights, on, on the books anyway. Tell us what the impact of the law is um, on transgender communities. Um, the law recognizes the rights of the third gender in Nepal. What is the, what is the impact at the community level of that? Okay. Uh, before uh, going for the success stories and the best practices that we have in Nepal, I want to highlight some challenges still there in Nepal in laws and impact, uh, laws and policies that impact the transgender lives in Nepal. First, I'd like to share you about the country code of Nepal, which is 100 years old country code that uh, now exists in Nepal. And that country code in chapter 26, it is a bestiality section, and it says that if somebody uh, do the unnatural sex, he or she can be punished. So that uh, uh, bestiality section is uh, still exists in the country code of Nepal. And, uh, so far, there is one case in the court. One gentleman, he brings this uh, case in court and uh, accusing the, our organization, Blue Diamond Society, to shut down because it is promoting the unnatural sex. It is the early 2002-03 when our organization is established. And that country court said that unnatural sex is punishable, but it doesn't say, uh, uh, doesn't say that what unnatural sex is. So people can predict that whether it's unnatural sex may be uh, oral sex or anal sex, or people can predict that it's unnatural sex be with the animal because it is under the bestiality section. So that is in our country code. Besides this, there is no any uh, criminalization laws and practice in our constitution and in our law. And, but we have the same like Bombay Public Nuisance Act, uh, same like in uh, Bombay that we have the uh, Public Offense Act 1970 and uh, Trafficking and Transportation Control Act 2007. And these two acts are widely used, widely misapplied to arrest the transgender people, uh, especially for the transgender sex workers. So when we are walking in the street and there are people gathered to see us and there is a traffic jam because the taxi driver also want to see us and police say that your visibility create the problem and your visibility uh, create the gathering in this uh, gathering of the people in the street. So uh, they arrest us because of we are disturbing the society, we are gathering the people in the street. So. Um, because of that a public nuisance act, public offense act, transgender people are arrested from the police. And 
uh, after paying the 25,000 Nepali rupees and after uh, having jail 25 days in the jail, we can uh, release from the jail. So it is the uh, Public Offense Act that is misapplied and misused to arrest the transgender people. And for the trans men, uh, the uh, Trafficking and the Transportation Act 9, 2007 is widely used because the trans man has a girlfriend and the, uh, their family, uh, the girlfriend of the trans man, their family and the police charge the trans man uh, because, of the, because they think that he is uh, kidnapping their daughter for the trafficking purpose. So these two acts are using to arrest the trans man and trans woman in Nepal. And the, Another thing is two questions that I, I would like to share with you that often asked from the police. Police said that can man or transgender be trafficked or can man and the transgender be raped? This is the two questions that police often ask to us. There are several cases in Nepal that when uh, several cases of Nepal where transgender people are trafficked in Mumbai brothels in India and the transgender people and men are raped. So when we go to the police station to file the complaint, police ask that can man or transgender be trafficked or can man or transgender can be raped? So that's the two questions the police ask because there is no law in these issues. The police says that this law is only for the girls and women to protect them. So there is no law for the transgender and trans women to protect from this kind of issues. So the uh, question is, there is not only the issues of criminalization, the issues of not having the same and equal rights for the, all the people. And recently, the uh, Law and Justice Ministry proposed the Civil and Criminal Code in Nepal. This uh, Civil and Criminal Code is going to be endorsed by the Parliament. If this is endorsed by the Parliament, then there is a chances of re criminalization of the LGBTI people in Nepal. So we are doing lots of advocacy, lobbying for these issues, not having passing this uh, civil and criminal code uh, from the parliament. So these are some challenges. So now I would like to share you some success that we have uh, in Nepal. In Supreme Court decision in 2007, Supreme Court of Nepal ordered the Nepal government to issue the citizenship right for the transgender people. Recently, the uh, Nepal government issued the citizenship uh, uh, card for the transgender people as others category, and they are planning to give the uh, passport also like uh, as per our gender identity. Recently, the um, immigration office in airport, they changed the form like male, female, and others. When you travel to Nepal, you can see that immigration form that include male, female, and others. So it is the impact of that Supreme Court decision. Soon after that Supreme Court decision 2007, some private sector like bank, Ansel, mobile company, and some uh, university, they changed their form like male, female, and others. And the government started to allocate the budget for the LGBTI people also uh, after that Supreme Court decision. And the uh, Supreme Court also ordered the Nepal government to form the same-sex marriage committee uh, to give the recommendation to the government to formulate the same-sex um, relationship law. And the now transgender are in uh, national youth policy. Uh, before, there is only male or female they are uh, addressed in national youth policy. Now transgender people are in national youth policy. And the education ministry also um, uh, addressed the SOGI issues in the school level curriculum in class five, six, seven, eight, and the university level curriculum. So these are some uh, good impact uh, that we have in Nepal. So and some, some challenges are still some there. Good practice, but uh -huh. there's still a ways to go in terms of translating some of these law and policy uh, into actual impact for the communities on the ground. But I think very progressive steps nonetheless. Daisy. Daisy is joining us from Uganda, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about her experience of uh, the impact of, of laws and law enforcement on the sex work community in Uganda. OK. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay, um, I come from a beautiful country in Uganda, the Pearl of Africa, where every day our parliament works on passing new laws that are affecting... <laughs> it's a very prolific legislature. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
that are affecting us. Um, the, the recent uh, newly passed the Anti-Homosexuality Act, where I am a victim and I um, happen to be a sex worker and uh, a bisexual. I have sex with women and men. So um, I was with my partner and the police came, three police officers came to my house. I don't know how they got directions, but I was staying at the flat, the fourth floor, and uh, the police came asking for me and my partner, and they told me that they have me on their list of homosexuals, and that they have all the list of homosexuals, and they're going to hunt them down until they end homosexual in the country. And I asked them where, the, where they got the proof from, I mean, it's not written on my forehead that I have sex with, with a transgender man. And uh, because when uh, the president had just signed the bill, the, we have a tabloid, the red paper, that published most of our faces and names. And uh, under the publication where my name and face was, was uh, homosexuality in schools, and below they listed a list of schools that promote homosexuals. And whoever could read the news looked like as if I promote homosexuality in school, which is, not, which is not true. So they say they're going to arrest me and my partner, and they drove us around for over six hours, and I had to plead and uh, you know, ask them to, not to arrest me, and they told me I do not have access to my house and I can't go back to my house anymore until I shift, because if they leave me, another team will come and arrest me because they have a big uh, number of uh, police officers they have trained who are going to arrest uh, the, 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 the LGBTI persons. And this really affected me much because I had to stay in hiding for over a week without taking my ARV medication. And, I, and a lot of people are going through the same thing. We have a lot of people who have run to neighboring countries and they're in the camp suffering. They have no access to their medicine and we don't know how long this is going to take. Um, we have also another newly uh, passed, the Anti-Pornography Act, which is also affecting our work. Um, I'll read the quote. Um, below uh, the, 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 the meaning of anti-pornography is that any representation of the sexual parts of a person for primary sexual excitement. In my work as a sex worker, I don't dress like this. I wear short skirts, I wear clothes that show my body to excite my clients. So if the police comes and arrests me while I'm doing my work, it's, it's, it's not... It's, it's not normal, it's not real. I mean, these laws are just there to, to, to drive us underground, to harass us. And uh, we also have another new, uh, the HIV prevention and control bill, which I call the HIV promotion uh, bill that is awaiting the president to be signed soon. We don't know when, anytime he can sign. Uh, which has uh, the promotion, it has uh, the mandatory disclosure, it has the forced disclosure, it has uh, mandatory testing, which is also going to be very harmful to the sex workers and it will drive us underground. And I don't think any sex worker will be able to test for HIV knowing that, knowing your HIV status is going to be used against you. Because with all these uh, laws in combination, you'll be arrested for being a sex worker, you know, or for anti-pornography, and then you'll be forcefully uh, be tested, and then they'll put a crime on you that you were there to, uh, to infect other people. So we really think that these laws, yes, in one way or the other, they have some clauses that are very helpful, but most of the clauses are there to harass us, and to drive us underground, especially uh, in, uh, in, in regards to access to HIV treatment. Um, the, 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 the good news is we managed to petition uh, the sex work community with uh, the LGBTI community. We petitioned uh, the Constitutional Court on the 
Anti-Homosexuality Act, and we haven't gotten the response yet. And uh, also uh, in May, we were also able to petition still the Constitutional Court um, about the Anti-Pornography Act. Um, and also there has been no response, but the recent uh, information we got from the lawyer was that uh, they called to ask for an extension as so we hopefully hope if there could be some amendments or some mm -hmm. hearing. So we are still uh, you know, praying for the best. Otherwise, these laws that are being passed and many others, we have the Public Order Management Bill Act, actually, which was also passed, that is also limiting us in uh, organizing and in not able to having public libraries. We're not supposed to, to petition. You have to notify the police before doing that. We have the, 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 the phone act. We have, you know, mm. being tapped, whatever you're talking. So it's a mess in Uganda, really. Being the pearl of Africa and having those kind of, of, of laws being passed every now and then, it puts uh, the, the lives of key populations at risk. And we see in Uganda the rates of HIV in, in some of these populations rising quite dramatically. I think what's striking is that um, we have some, in some cases, old laws, archaic laws, that need to be modernized, as Nick so eloquently told us. But in this case, it's a story of a range of new laws that are being passed, uh, which are curtailing human rights, which are making it more and more difficult for us to, uh, to step up the pace of effective HIV responses.